Indiana Congressman Dan Burton shares this for our hearing. The committee will present celebrations from the Uh Mr. Barrett's made a request. We'll grant him a brief moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just uh, want to begin. Yesterday uh, in our hearing, we had a, um, a motion to send some uh, depositions over the Justice Department. Uh, I support that. Um, at the time, we had the vote. The issue really was whether there was going to be disclosure of all depositions, which is, of course, something we support on this at this time. Um, but when I looked at the, the, the motion, um, that is something that I do support. I think that in order to move the investigation forward, those depositions should be going to that uh, to the Justice Department. So I just wanted to make that statement for the record. A Mr. Chairman, gentleman's statement will be included in the record. Uh, point of personal privilege. A gentleman will state his point. Uh, yesterday, uh, I made reference to the um, press conference which Vice President Gore held on Monday, March 3rd, 1997. I did not ask unanimous consent to have it inserted in the record. I'd like to do that at this time. Without objection. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman, <coughs> chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs, it's not Foreign Affairs anymore, International Operations Committee. International Relations, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we welcome uh, Director Lou Free back again with us, and we thank you for your patience and the length of time uh, we uh, imposed on you yesterday. Um, Director Free, the Attorney General testified yesterday that there must be sufficient credible evidence on a covered person which would have triggered the implementation of the Independent Counsel Act before the FBI could investigate such an individual. Can you tell us, have there been any instances that you are aware of, of the FBI agents wanting to interview someone, requesting documents or following leads on covered persons as defined in the Independent Counsel Statute or any other act or any other others uh, and that they were thwarted by officials of the Department of Justice because of that condition that I've just recited. Um, there have been instances, um, Mr. Gilman, where the, the timing of certain interviews, particularly uh, with respect to covered persons, were the subjects of uh, discussion and sometimes uh, even uh, disagreement in terms of the timing as to when those interviews should be conducted. Uh, for instance, there were discussions about whether people should be interviewed early in the inquiry or at a point where uh, more information and evidence has been developed. But the ultimate uh, result in answer to your question is that uh, I don't believe the, uh, the agents who were conducting the inquiry were thwarted from interviewing any covered person uh, because of a determination that uh, the statute had to be triggered before they were allowed to be uh, spoken to. But there were disagreements about the timing, uh, and that's uh, something that, uh, you know, we've discussed and, and have discussed on an ongoing basis. Well, I, I just wanted to be clear with regard to our committee, since the Attorney General said she had to make a decision if you were investigating a covered person, that there had been sufficient credible evidence to initiate to the trigger mechanism for the Independent Counsel Act. And uh, uh, are you clear, clear now of, uh, of what I'm requesting, that did that necessitate a delay by your agency in making an investigation? Yes, in the sense that um, the covered person may have been interviewed and perhaps there was a uh, desire on behalf of the investigators to do an interview uh, earlier than the designation, the legal designation which you've just articulated. But at the end of the day, the person in question, persons in question were interviewed. Um, would, the, would the gentleman yield? I'd be that? pleased to yield. Uh, did that create a sense of frustration among some of your agents that were trying to do that? I mean, we have read in a number of publications that there really was a sense of frustration on the part of some of the agents that were being obstructed from talking to some of these people. Oh, we did that. Yes, there, as I, I think I alluded to yesterday, there were times when uh, the investigators felt that uh, interviews and the focus uh, of interviews should move quicker than uh, the attorneys who were managing the inquiry or the grand jury 
uh, otherwise uh, decided, and that was the source of some frustration at different points. But as I mentioned, uh, no one was not interviewed, and nobody was uh, 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 insulated from being interviewed because of those disagreements. The disagreement was really the timing of the interview and what the overall focus was. Let me, let me if the gentleman would yield further, let me just I'd be pleased to yield the gentleman. One of the things that uh, uh, I, I've noted in a number of uh, investigations is that timing of the interview by an agent is important. And if, if somebody at Justice uh, postponed the interview for some time, which would allow the person to be interviewed to be more fully prepared or to be able to cover their derriere, uh, might be considered an, uh, impeding the, the process of justice. Was that ever a complaint? Not that uh, justice was being impeded. There's different theories to conducting investigations. One theory is you go out and speak to everybody immediately because you lock people into statements uh, as well as facts. Another theory is you wait until you have sufficient evidence to conduct a more informative interview, a more confrontational interview, and put the person in the position where they have to tell you facts you can corroborate or not accurately uh, answer those questions. Depending on the investigation, one theory may be a stronger suit than the other. So uh, I don't think there's any uh, right or wrong way of doing it depending on the case. What is important is that the ultimate objectives uh, were accomplished and nobody was uh, uh, made uh, invulnerable or insulated from interviews. I thank the gentleman. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Free, when you took the uh, on the responsibilities as director of the FBI, it was against the backdrop of a White House official calling directly to the FBI with instructions to investigate alleged wrongdoing by long-standing non-political career-type employees of the White House Travel Office. I understand that you informed the President that for you to take on the responsibilities as director of the FBI, you insisted that the Federal Bureau of Investigation must maintain its independence and have no role in politics. Is that why you said no to the call for information on the Bureau's Chinese Money Connection Inquiry and a push for the appointment of an independent counsel? With respect to the first part of your question, yes, that was the condition under which I took this job. I told the President when he asked me what were the conditions under which I would accept the job, and I certainly made it clear, and he agreed that uh, I would be politically independent, appropriately so as the director. With respect to the decisions which you, uh, which you cite, uh, again, I made those decisions with the intent of not only uh, preserving the political independence of the FBI, but the integrity of the investigation. It's bad practice, in my view, to do anything uh, which potentially alerts uh, prospective subjects uh, as to uh, the course of the investigation or evidence. I think it's, it's bad practice and, and should not be done. And we want to commend you for maintaining the independence of the FBI. And one last question, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, since uh, my time was utilized by the exchange. How many FBI agents are now working on this matter of illegal foreign campaign contributions and other illegal activity involving the DNC during the last presidential election? What portion of your budget is being allocated to that? Uh, there are 54 uh, special agents uh, assigned on a full-time basis to the uh, overall investigation. There's 39 professional support, which include uh, paralegals as well as investigative analysts. Um, I can get some budgetary figures for you. Just I don't ru roughly what percentage? Um, uh, there, there's several millions of dollars, of course, invested here. You know, we have an overall uh, budget of about $3 billion. I, I'll try to get a... I would just be guessing at it right now. But it, it is a major investigation. I mean, if you compared it with anything else we've done uh, historically, it's a major investigation. With your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask the director to submit that at a later date. Yeah. Thank Without you. Objection. Thank you. And thank you, Director Free. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on uh, the questioning of my good friend from New York. He raised the issue of the political independence of the FBI, which uh, I would consider critical. Um, 
Has there been at any time any attempt on the part of the White House to interfere with the independence of your agency, Director Free? Um, as far as, uh, you know, my tenure as director, um, no, I would say uh, there has been no uh, attempt that I would uh, recognize as such to interfere with what I think is appropriately so the political independence of the FBI. Well, since we all feel passionately that the political independence of the FBI must be preserved at all costs, uh, let me pursue it with respect to the Vice President's office. Has there been any attempt at any time to interfere with the political independence of your agency by the Vice President's office? No, sir. Has there been any attempt by any other agency of government uh, to interfere with your independence? No, I don't believe so. So, uh, so basically, your answer to Mr. Gilman's probing is that we are dealing with a non-issue, that political interference with the independence of the FBI has not been part of your experience as director of the FBI. Well, it's not been part of my experience. Uh, as you know, of course, uh, the independent counsel, uh, Ken Starr, is looking at the issue of the FBI uh, files, which of course has been the subject of great interest and inquiry by this committee. I don't know the That's results right. of those investigations, but from my point of view and from where I sit, uh, I have not seen what I would call an attempt, as far as I can prove it, of uh, political interference. Let me raise an issue concerning the Chinese involvement in our 1996 elections. I realize that you are under constraints in terms of the extent to which you can deal with that. But as one who has studied the macro figures of the 1996 elections, as I'm sure you have as well, um, what is the quantitative importance of alleged Chinese political interference with the 1996 elections in terms of the totality of spending during the course of that election? Uh, Mr. Lantos, it would be, would be very difficult for me to, first of all, to approximate that, but uh, even to address it. Uh, as you know, it's been the subject of classified briefings to this committee and others, and uh, I, would, I would be respectfully reluctant to, uh, to get into that, and it would also be difficult to approximate uh, an answer to your question. You agree with me that uh, of all the items uh, that we have been exploring, this clearly is potentially the most serious one. I think all of the items uh, that we're exploring are, are serious as to which one ultimately proves by fact to be uh, the most serious. I, I, it's hard to estimate at this point. Uh, anytime uh, a law enforcement agency is investigating uh, the commission of a crime or the potential commission of a crime, uh, it's very serious. And uh, the external matters which you refer to are uh, of critical seriousness to the national security as well as the criminal laws, but uh, how they all prove out to be uh, based on what we know now is difficult to, to predict. Is there any arena where you would like to just give us your views um, beyond the questions that you have been asked by members of this committee? I want to give you an opportunity to express any other thoughts that you may have. Yes, no, I appreciate that very much. I just, uh, I mean, as I've said before, I, I will uh, continue to do my very best to ensure the uh, independence of the FBI. And I think that's critical for the country. It's critical for everybody's rights who are potentially affected by an agency with such awesome powers. Um, and I pledge to uh, continue to do that. And uh, if, uh, if at any time we, uh, we make a misstep or a misjudgment and we create the perception that it's otherwise, that's as bad as the reality of it being otherwise. But you have in the FBI, um, uh, I think, a, a crown uh, jewel in the United States. You have uh, men and women who 
and I see them every day on a daily basis do uh, great good for the country and uh, despite a couple of missteps here and there, uh, there's nobody in the FBI with a political agenda. We have uh, I, a job to do and we want to do it correctly and fairly. I think my colleagues uh, share my view that we have the highest regard for your agency and for your leadership of that agency. Final question relates to your relationship in the future to the Attorney General in view of this uh, unfortunate attempt to try to drive a wedge between the Attorney General and yourself. Yesterday, both of you were uh, extremely complimentary of each other's performance and of each other as individuals. Is it unrealistic on our part to hope that this uh, minor blip will fade into the background and your working relationship with the Attorney General will continue to be cordial, cooperative, exemplary, and pleasant. No, I, I, I have every confidence it will remain a, a very strong relationship. But, you know, as I alluded to yesterday, um, and again, I'm not speaking so much for myself as perhaps maybe a, a future FBI director, um, I have to tell you that uh, the next time I sit down and write a memo to the Attorney General on a matter of this uh, importance and substance, I am going to have in the back of my mind uh, a thought that it was not as strong as it was when I wrote this memo, which is that uh, even though uh, uh, what I put in there is, is, is frank and honest and uh, very sensitive, uh, I think uh, it creates the uh, awareness that uh, it's an issue that, uh, you know, is, is potentially something I have to consider. I think that's I think that's a bad thing for uh, people in my position and, and future directors, which is why I'm hopeful, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I spoke to you yesterday, that uh, uh, Mr. Bennett and lawyers for the Justice Department can discuss this issue. I spoke to the Attorney General this morning, and she told me uh, to relay to you that her lawyers uh, would be uh, pleased to engage with Mr. Bennett. And I think for the good of the process, and uh, because I wrote the memo and I know what's in there, uh, it is a much more preferable course to see if we can work that out and uh, avoid what is really a, not only a constitutional issue, but a, an issue that will impact adversely on uh, what you expect to get from us, which we want to give you in many cases, and what we have to protect at some uh, critical parts of an ongoing case. If I may just follow up on this thought, your answer to this question underscores the validity of the Attorney General's statement yesterday that attempts by congressional committees to obtain confidential memoranda written by the FBI Director to the Attorney General chill the atmosphere and discourage the degree of candor that the Attorney General ought to be able to expect of you. I fully agree with your statement and I hope there will not be future attempts to obtain such memoranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shaddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just follow up on the points uh, that my colleague, Mr. Lantos, made. He questioned you about political independence and about this issue of a wedge. Um, I want to begin by saying, number one, as a former law enforcement official and assistant attorney general in Arizona, I respect what you're doing. I encourage you to be an independent voice. I admire your record, and uh, I would encourage you to hang in there, uh, notwithstanding what I consider to be some improper uh, influences. Mr. Lantos referred to uh, there being no intent to interfere with you in a political sense. I won't ask you to comment on it, but quite frankly, I think the remarks last week by the White House, which were guarded, and which Mr. McMurray advised the press, or McCurry advised the press to read as they would, uh, besmirched your record, um, came at a point in time right after you had exercised your independence, which I think the nation should want you to do. And if that wasn't an attempt to interfere with your political independence, I don't know what was. And if there is a problem here, I see a problem uh, in terms of a wedge not driven between you and the Attorney General. She apparently respects your independence. I see a wedge be trying to be driven between you and the public based on the fact that you had the courage to speak your mind and to give her the right kind of advice. So um, I, I applaud that conduct. Uh, and I quite frankly think the President uh, was grossly improper in following your whoever nobody likes the leak of that memo but once it became out the president says well 
he has something critical to say about me or something I don't like, so I'm going to be critical about him. Quite frankly, I think it was petty and inappropriate and was, in fact, at least a veiled attempt to interfere with your independence, and I resent it, and I think a lot of people in America resent it. Um, having said that, I want to turn to an issue I discussed yesterday. Um, in the 29-page uh, report released by the Attorney General in her decision not to uh, continue the investigation, she says, point blank, I have determined that there are no reasonable grounds to believe that further investigation is warranted into the allegation that the Vice President broke the law and illegally raised campaign funds. I was very encouraged that in response to Mr. Cox's questions yesterday, you indicated that even that topic, the topic of the illegality of phone calls by the president, by the vice president, remained open. Is that, did I hear you correctly on that point? Yes, sir, it's fully open. Okay. Um, I was also stunned yesterday to review this entire document and to find that, uh, well, let me ask you, have you read it? Yes, sir. Um, she devotes uh, almost a third of this document to making the case that the president did not know that some of these funds would be used as campaign money, that is hard money, which could not legally be raised from a government office. Do you mean the president or the vice president? Vice president. She devotes a whole section of this, quite a bit of it, to trying to make the case that he did not know that he was raising campaign funds. You would agree with me? That's a good portion of this report? Yes, sir. Um, so that would go to the issue of whether or not he knew his conduct was illegal. And I'm troubled by that because normally in the law, knowing that your conduct is not illegal is not an element. That is to say, if I'm stopped by a peace officer for speeding, I can't say to him, I didn't know I was speeding, and he'll say, oh, well, okay, that's, that's all right, you're off. Correct? Yes. And it wouldn't be a defense, let's say I went back to my office and, it was, and I spent the next uh, 10 days in my office doing nothing but making campaign fundraising calls from my government office, it would not be a defense to that, to a prosecution for that conduct if I said, well, my chief of staff told me I could do that from my office and I believed her, would it? Except as it went to intent. Except as it went to intent. But it would not necessarily be a defense to the crime. No. Okay. Um, you're in charge with, uh, your agency is charged with investigating this. Um, do you know the date on which the President, Vice President was questioned about uh, those fundraising calls? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, November 11th of 1997. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, in his press conference, which went on for, I guess, 30 or 45 minutes, uh, almost a year earlier, on March 3rd, 1997, uh, nowhere does the Vice President ever indicate that he thought he was raising soft money, and in fact, you were here yesterday when I brought out four different quotes by the Vice President in which he said he thought he was raising money for, quote-unquote, our re-election. Wouldn't you think what he said candidly and voluntarily shortly after this issue became public would be more uh, solid evidence of what he believed and what his state of mind was than an interview conducted almost a year later where he'd heard that the Attorney General was already looking at the issue of soft money and saying, well, if he was raising soft money, uh, then we're off the hook? Yeah, I, I just don't think it's, it's appropriate for me to comment on his intent or knowledge um, really at any point. Um, well, does it, as an investigator, wouldn't you have thought that what he said a year earlier describing his own conduct deserved at least some mention in her report? on that issue? You know, it's not my report and, you know, what processes went in and what she included or deleted, I'm just, I'm not aware of. Um, well, I find it stunning that she spends a third of this report, including uh, a number of questions, including describing the phone call she made or her investigators made to these contributors in which they all said they understood it was soft money. And these are people out across America questioned a year later, they say, well, we all understood it was soft money, and yet, uh, days after the issue became public, the Vice President gives a 45-minute long press conference. He never mentions that he thought it was soft money, and he, in fact, describes it as raising money for our re-election campaign, which would be hard money. And I quite frankly see that as a huge flaw in her report. I'm encouraged that the investigation is still open. Uh, I quite frankly think the evidence is clear that he did violate the law. 
Uh, I think there may be an argument that he couldn't be successfully prosecuted for it, but I believe he violated the law. The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Free. Um, sure. I was intrigued by uh, perhaps the most um, 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 significant statement in your testimony, and I'm quoting, in recommending that an independent counsel be appointed, I did not and do not imply that I believe any particular person has committed a crime is the target of investigation or even has done anything improper. I recommend an appointment of an independent counsel to investigate whether crimes may have been committed. Are you aware that the independent counsel statute says that there, that there must be specific and credible evidence that a covered person has committed a crime? It says may have committed a crime. Do you believe that a covered person may have committed a crime? Because that is not what the statement says. Your statement from yesterday says. It implies that you don't see any covered person. You don't, you don't see any evidence. Uh, or you don't want to imply that any covered person has committed a crime or even has done anything improper. And yet, you believe that an independent counsel should have been appointed. I'm trying to find the basis yeah. upon which you believe an independent counsel should okay. have been appointed. I, I think we're talking about two different things. The, uh, the trigger in the statute is not that a crime has been committed. Actually, that used to be in the statute, and then in the uh, revisions, the Congress changed that. The governing language is that a, a crime may have been committed. Uh, my statement yesterday um, spoke to uh, two issues. The first issue was uh, the one that I said uh, made me reluctant to publish my recommendation because many people could misunderstand the recommendation like that or one under the independent counsel statute to believe exactly what you asked me about that someone had committed a crime. Uh, so I wanted to make, uh, make that clear. The fact that um, uh, the statute would be triggered uh, does not mean that a crime has been committed or that any findings of guilt or innocence have been made. It simply means that further investigation is required. <coughs> well, uh, if you can trigger a criminal statute of this time, kind because cr further information is required, then I really wonder about whether we ought to rein in the statute. Uh, the, the, the specific and credible evidence, it seems to me, uh, is an important safeguard. It, it became known uh, before your memo that you disagreed with the Attorney General. How did that first become known? I don't know. I wish I did. Uh, were, you asked and, uh, were you asked that question, and did you have occasion to answer that question before your memo uh, was written? I mean, why did the press know before your memo was written that you disagreed with the Attorney General? Well, these uh, discussions within the Department of Justice, both uh, between the Attorney General and I, and the people on the task force have been ongoing for months. And one of the key subjects of those discussions, which involves a larger and larger circle of people, have been uh, going on for many, many months. So unfortunately, uh, some of that spilled out before uh, the memo was written. But the memo uh, does not, for the first time, uh, raise these issues. Um is it your practice uh, to make it known to the Attorney General when you disagree with her prosecutorial decision? If it's a FBI case, and uh, particularly a case uh, uh, about which we consult, and she asks me my opinion, absolutely. No, I ask, is it your practice? Uh, is it your practice as a general matter to make it known when you disagree with the decision that the prosecutor makes? Or is this an unusual occurrence? It's an unusual occurrence in the sense that I don't, and neither does the Attorney General, uh, regularly get involved in uh, charging decisions, uh, except for a very uh, small number of cases. Uh, so it is not my practice to uh, get involved in charging decisions, either in the Department of Justice or in the U.S. Attorney's offices. However, from time to time, uh, I have uh, intervened in cases where I thought uh, charges should be brought or not brought for one particular reason or the other, but it's not something that I frequently do. Uh, you've been an assistant U.S. attorney yourself? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have occasion to use the FBI when you were an assistant U.S. attorney? Yes. <coughs> Did you find that sometimes the uh, investigators, the <coughs> FBI, 
wanted to prosecute when the lawyer or the prosecutor thought otherwise? Yes. Isn't it natural that investigators who have put a lot of time and effort and grunt work uh, into investigations uh, have a tendency to want to go forward with what they have uncovered and prosecute? Isn't that pretty much naturally built in structurally into being an investigator? No, I don't think so. I think it depends on the case. I've had cases where as a prosecutor I wanted to go forward and FBI agents have told me not to go forward. I think it depends on the facts and circumstances. Um, did this, in, in your judgment, did this leak uh, concerning the memo come from within the FBI or, out, or do you think it came from the larger Justice Department or, outs or outside the FBI? I don't know. We're conducting an inquiry as we do in all these matters. Uh, I hope uh, in this case we can come up with what happened and uh, if we do, there would be serious consequences. What precautions? have you taken to assure that the confidentiality of uh, your uh, advice to the Attorney General would be respected in that we could depend upon this not happen happening again? I mean, do you have a home computer? I'm sorry? <laughs> uh, do you have a home computer? I'm, I'm, I'm asking what precautions you have taken, if I could just finish this, this, this question, Mr. Chairman. You said that the, the, yesterday in your, your testimony that these, uh, that their leaks have occurred, uh, uh, that multiple leaks have occurred and they're occurring all the time and that they have occurred in an instance with which you obviously regret. I'm asking you what have, what have you done to, uh, to assure that this kind of leak will not occur in the future? I've told people that I will fire them if they leak, or I will have them prosecuted if they're not you in the FBI. You told them that before. Well, I tell them it frequently. Um, I've told uh, and suggested that uh, when we have certain leaks, we ought to have a grand jury proceeding as opposed to administrative inquiry. Uh, I handled this particular memo as carefully as I could. I made only six copies. Uh, we accounted for each one of them. Uh, people who were deeply involved in the case not only didn't know about the memo, but didn't know uh, the timing of its presentation. We rely on people's good faith and honesty and integrity. Unfortunately, as I said yesterday, uh, when if I ever write my memoirs, the most frustrating thing about Washington in this particular job are leaks, which I deplore and which uh, people should be arrested for. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Free, again, it's good to see you here again today. Uh, I want to just make a brief comment about what was said uh, before about wedges and that uh, some on the other side are suggesting that we are trying to drive a wedge between you and other people. I don't think that's the case. I, I know that uh, in a letter that you jointly signed with uh, Ms. Reno, uh, and I'm quoting, <coughs> this was at least from the, the New York Times, quote, public, public and judicial confidence in the criminal justice process would be undermined by congressional intrusion into an ongoing c criminal investigation, end quote. If that is, in fact, uh, an accurate quote, uh, what this is all about is public confidence in the federal government and in the ability of, of people in high levels to be making uh, decisions and the judgment that is being used to drive those decisions and, and the reasons for making those decisions. And we have, in this instance, two of the top law enforcement officials in the federal government who have differing opinions. And um, uh, so there is no wedge that is being created here. Uh, we're not creating a wedge. We're just trying to understand how two people, whom we both respect, have come to two different uh, uh, positions. And I think there are a lot of people around the country that are scratching their heads trying to understand that as well. Uh, now I would like to uh, yield to Mr. Cox. Thank you. Appreciate your yielding. Uh, Director Free, uh, yesterday uh, we talked a bit about the independent counsel statute, about the law uh, with the Attorney General and with you. Uh, under the independent counsel statute, uh, the decision whether to initiate a preliminary investigation uh, is made on the basis of the AG's assessment of whether there is specific and credible evidence. And if there is, then uh, she is supposed to, within 30 days, initiate a preliminary investigation to see whether fur further investigation is reasonable. And if that further investigation is reasonable under the independent counsel statute, uh, it must be done by an independent counsel. Is that right? 
Yes. If, if further inquiry is, is required after whatever last extension of that right. period. Right. Uh, now, it is discretionary for the Attorney General uh, if uh, there is not a presumed conflict of interest as there is with certain named people in the statute like the President or the Vice President. Uh, it's discretionary and uh, uh, it depends on her judgment of whether, according to the statute, there is a conflict of interest, potentially a conflict of interest, uh, that is uh, political, personal, or uh, financial. Is that right? Yeah, actually, in the new statute, they're not named individuals anymore, except for a few. There are people above a certain pay grade in the executive branch. But you're correct. Uh, now, uh, yesterday I read from a Los Angeles Times article in which uh, uh, it was discussed how $10,000 checks were passed out in Southern California. Uh, how uh, people were writing checks to the DNC who didn't know what the DNC was, how they were reimbursed, and all of this money came from, uh, in one of the specific examples, uh, the Bank of China in Macau. Uh, under the statute, do you think that that is specific and credible uh, evidence that a crime may have been committed? Um, it could be. Well, I'm asking you whether because uh, you are now in possession of that information as well, whether you think that's specific and credible evidence. Is it not specific enough, or is it not credible, or is it both? Uh, I, I think to, to answer that question, I would be giving you some conclusions. Which is exactly respect, what I'm asking for. Well, I don't think, with all due respect, it's appropriate for me to do that. That is a subject uh, uh, potentially under inquiry, and to tell you before the Attorney General makes those determinations. I'm just asking you to uh, give me your read of a Los Angeles Times article. I would uh, hesitate to give you the read of any article, but I certainly uh, don't think it's appropriate for me to analyze an article for you. All right, let me uh, ask you the other question. Uh, let us assume that that Los Angeles Times article, which was worked on by a lot of reporters, which followed up on hearings by this committee, which included information taken under oath, uh, is at least credible evidence, uh, and that it is specific uh, as far as it goes. Uh, the only reason then, if hypothetically we say it's specific and credible, uh, for us not to appoint an independent counsel is that in our judgment, if we were the Attorney General, there is no potential political conflict of interest with these people like Charlie Tree or John Juan or Antonio Pan. Is that correct? Yes. If you were the Attorney General making the decision under the statute, you could uh, either decide there was a potential conflict or not decide. And finally, uh, I had a discussion yesterday with the Attorney General uh, uh, because I heard her to say that she needs to find an actual conflict of interest. The statute says potential. Uh, she read from a memo. Uh, I've had a chance now to read that memo myself. The memo is correct. Uh, I believe that it was the impression that uh, she loaned in her testimony that was incorrect. But the memo and the statute are consistent. They both say that the conflict of interest must be potential, not actual. Is that your understanding of the statute? I, I don't think, you know, my view of the statute on this particular issue, since it... But well, it's very important, because if we have to find an actual conflict of interest, that's a much higher standard. But if the statute says, as it does, that there may be a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest, well, then it's potential conflicts of interest we're worried about, and that standard is obviously much lower. There are other lawyers who will cite the legislative history and talk about the actuality as opposed to the reality of the but conflict. The legislative history that was cited by the Attorney General yesterday pointed out was that Congress intended that there be the potential for an actual conflict of interest, not the potential for an appearance, which of course would be mere tissue. Uh, but is it your understanding uh, that it's a potential for an actual conflict of interest? Um, I just don't think my understanding is, is relevant since I don't make those decisions. Uh, I think a statute, uh, if you want to ask me as a, as a former judge, I do. Uh, you know, different schools of, uh, uh, of judges and lawyers, uh, I was always taught and believed that statutes ought to be strictly construed. I appreciate it. Appreciate Gentleman's it, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I welcome uh, Director Free um, and I, too, uh, agree that you, you're doing an outstanding job in, as a lawyer. Uh, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, in listening to your testimony uh, yesterday and today, um, one of the things that impressed me was the fact that you 
have a tremendous or appear to have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, the Attorney General. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you listened to, <clears throat> you were here, and some of us were surprised that you were here during her entire testimony, and we saw that as a very good thing um, and very positive. And I'm not here to drive a wedge uh, between you two. I think, from what I've seen, it's a very close relationship. But um, let me ask you this so that we can be very clear with regard to your opinion. I think we sort of skirted around this, and, but we haven't hit it right in the bullseye. Um, you listened to the testimony of the Attorney General. Do you have any reason to believe that um, she is out uh, just trying to protect the President, the Vice President, or Ms. O'Leary? Well, as I said yesterday, my, uh, my understanding and belief, again, based on working with Janet Reno for four and a half years on many issues, is that uh, she took the facts and the law and made uh, the best and most honest uh, decision with all the integrity in the world, and uh, that's how she got to her result and by no other means. Thank you. So the answer would be you, you don't think that she's just out trying to protect them, as has been stated in various publications and by many people. I think she made the decision on the law and the facts in her view. Thank you. Let me ask you this. Um, you said something a little bit earlier that concerned me a bit, and I just want you to, to clarify, and I think uh, we on this side uh, of the aisle are a bit concerned. Uh, you were talking about uh, possibly uh, that you had gotten, had a conversation uh, with Ms. Reno, I think you said this morning, with regard to trying to come up with some kind of compromise with regard to certain information in the memo, the memo that you had written, is that right? Yes. And I noted that you said that you would get together or your, uh, your employees would get together with Mr. Bennett. Um, there was no mention of the Democratic side. We represent the American people, too. Sure. Uh, we, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we want to make sure that we're included. But I, I just found it interesting, and a number of us did, that you mentioned Mr. Bennett, uh, but uh, we who represent almost half of the American people uh, was not mentioned there. I, I don't know whether that was a misstatement or you, I mean, do you just see it from the Republican side or what? I certainly don't see anything from either the Republican or the Democratic side. Uh -huh. Mr. Bennett is the counsel that, uh, that I've been dealing with uh, as a witness here, and uh, I assume that any uh, discussions between departmental lawyers and himself on this issue is uh, inclusive to the committee, but I certainly didn't mean by uh, mentioning him that, uh, well, I didn't mean anything by that. But I, someone said, uh, said a long time ago, we on this side are not part of plants, and we were just kind of sure. concerned about that. Let me ask you this. Um, Mr. Gilman asked you a very, uh, a very uh, excellent question, and you agreed to supply him with certain information. Uh, he asked you about how much resources were being directed from your staff with regard to the DNC uh, investigation. He used DNC. And I'm w wondering, can, uh, is there uh, Republicans in the investigation here? I'm, I'm just curious. The investigation is not, as I said yesterday, structured along uh, party lines or uh, person lines or office holder lines. It is a broad-based inquiry into uh, all aspects of the uh, 1996 uh, campaign and issues uh, surrounding that and on both sides of it. Well, the thing that concerned me, as I said, when he asked his question, he specifically asked about DNC. And I wouldn't be asking this question if, it, if he had not asked it that way. And you said that you would supply him with information, uh, I think it was figures, how much it would cost, how much it's costing with regard to investigating the DNC. Now that's one party. And I was just wondering, is there a breakdown for anything other than that? What, what, I, uh, what I will supply him with, what I'll supply the entire committee with, is the, uh, the amount of uh, expenditures with respect to what we call the CampCon investigation, which is our acronym for campaign contributions. It doesn't devolve to one uh, party or one person or the other, and I would provide those overall figures. I don't think, th there is no breakdown between, you know, parts of that investigation or uh, subjects or entities, uh, but I'll give you all the figures that we've been spending. We would also ask on this side that uh, you include minority counsel because we don't always get information. Uh, <laughs> our counsel and we would like to have 
information, and we think that we're entitled to it. We'd appreciate that. Let me ask you one other thing. Um, you were talking about your memo a little bit earlier, um, and, the fa and Ms. Reno, I think, used these words. I don't think they were your words. She said that the memo that was written uh, could possibly provide a roadmap, or, or did provide a roadmap with regard to the investigation. Um, would you agree with that? I would agree with the, uh, uh, the proposition that in the memo are discussed different theories of the investigations, different scopes of the investigation, and clearly uh, somebody reading that could be alerted to what the proposed courses would be with respect to this investigation. And you also said a little bit earlier that, you know, that you, if you, I think you said that if you had to do this again, that is writing the memo, you might, you might do it a little bit differently. Um, and I'm just wondering, are most of your memos um, something of this magnitude uh, that affects, could affect the President of the United States, one of the most powerful countries in the world? Um, does it concern you and, and possibly uh, putting certain defendants or potential defendants in a position uh, where they might be in a position to, Mr. Chairman, I just want the two minutes that you gave Mr. Cox. That's all I want. I'm almost finished. We'll, we'll let you finish your question. Thank you. That's all I want. I, I timed it. Um, j I'm just curious as to when you're doing a roadmap memo and you're giving it to six people and then to find it in publications all over the country, um, how would you do it any differently? Because I, I'm just curious because that, I mean, that, I know that concerns you. I've listened to what you've said and I, and I certainly agree with yes. you. But well, that is a very serious situation considering the fact that we are spending millions upon millions of dollars with regard to these investigations when people can't even send their kids to college. And then to the idea that a roadmap could be out there for all the public to see to basically uh, squash the very things that we're trying to do with all this money, tax dollars we're spending. I'm just curious, how would you do it differently? Well, I'm, I am also uh, very concerned about those issues. Um, I don't know that I would do it any differently, um, but the roadmap, as you describe it, and as I describe it, uh, is not out there, which is why I said yesterday, I don't believe anybody has this memo uh, in the press, or you would be reading things that I know they would report, which are not been reported. So I don't feel and I don't believe that that memo is out there and that that roadmap is out there. How we would do this uh, uh, in the future to eliminate it, I could, I could have, uh, uh, you know, uh, core of, uh, conversations in the hallway with the Attorney General of the United States. I don't think that's uh, a good response to uh, an inability in either the FBI or the Department of Justice to control sensitive information. Uh, I think if I had to do it again, I would do the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, going back to the Franklin Roosevelt administration, each administration has had a policy on the clearance of testimony, the review of testimony by high-ranking officials before they come up to the Hill. Was your statement cleared by OMB and or the White House? As far as I know, it was not. I gave a copy to the Attorney General. Uh, she gave me a copy of hers, uh, but there were no editing or suggestions done. I don't know if OMB uh, got it or not. Yeah. Maybe I can find it. Is, that, uh, is that the usual procedure? I'm told they did not get a copy. Yeah. Uh, is that what is the usual procedure to review? The usual procedure would be if I'm talking about uh, uh, counterterrorism or uh, um, encryption, which I won't talk about today. Um, yeah, we send it up to uh, OMB. They review it. Sometimes they have uh, suggestions. Sometimes they have objections. We discuss that. Uh, that was not done in this case. You were listening with great care yesterday to the answers and the questions given the Attorney General. And I know you as a high official probably face the same thing many high officials do. When you're head of a large agency, there are possibilities where there'll be conflicts of interest in terms of who represents whom. She cited the so-called prison guard problem in the Department of Justice where they might have a case on one side of it and there's also a case on the other side of it. Uh, what uh, she didn't say uh, was that uh, the president does not appoint prison guards. The president uh, appoints the attorney general. Uh, do you find real problems in the administration of the conflict of interest situation with injustice when they have to represent the whole government going into court, and yet they might have a stake in this one way or the other? What's your reading on that as a former judge? 
Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's really a fact-specific situation. And when I was on the bench, uh, every time we got a new case, uh, both myself and my law clerks would look at it uh, carefully to see if there was any potential from conflict. In fact, I went on the bench directly from the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. So not only the assistance, but even some of the matters uh, were matters that I had uh, presided over as Deputy U.S. Attorney. Uh, I think it's fact-specific. I think it requires uh, great care, conscientiousness, um, but it's really specific as to the, the case involved. When you uh, look at the uh, ability of the FBI to get to witnesses and take their testimony, uh, who gives you the authority to issue a subpoena? Is it the U.S. attorney in the particular region? Is it the attorney general? Is it the chair of the task force? Let's say you're going after people outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, Mr. Cox asked a series of questions on various people that have escaped our jurisdiction. They're overseas. Uh, what do you do in a situation like that, as well as the ones within the United States? With respect to within the United States, uh, the investigators would go to the prosecutors on the task force and request a subpoena, or the prosecutors would tell the agents they want to subpoena such and such person or records and provide the process. If it was out of the district, we would go through the U.S. Attorney's Office. For instance, in Los Angeles, there are full-time investigators and task force attorneys assigned to this investigation. If it was overseas, uh, we would go through the uh, legats, the FBI representatives in those countries. We might ask for judicial assistance in a foreign country. We could ask for a material witness warrant to have someone uh, detained uh, in response to the uh, subpoena. But it's a process that goes through uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office because they are the uh, people charged with the administration of the grand jury's inquiry. Could a judge issue you a subpoena if you weren't satisfied with the U.S. Attorney's decision? Uh, probably not. A judge could issue a writ uh, or an order, uh, depending on whether it was an aid of his or her jurisdiction, but could not issue, uh, could not, that's a good question, could a judge who does supervise the grand jury issue a grand jury subpoena? I've got to uh, talk to somebody who knows that. Under the wiretap situation, yeah. you go to a judge ordinarily to get that subpoena and that authority. Yes, sir. That's an order, but the right. statute uh, provides for that. Uh, given the jurisdiction of this committee and the issues before it of the 1996 presidential election, are there any witnesses that the FBI has wanted to depose uh, and issue a, have a subpoena issued that any member of the U.S. attorney staff the chair of the task force has turned down and said, no, you can't interview that person. Have you had any particular request stopped somewhere in the process? No, not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, uh, except, as I said before, as to the timing of interviews, uh, that has been the subject of some uh, disagreements at different points. Uh, yesterday I happened to mention uh, to the Attorney General the Hudson dog track case where uh, a lobbyist that fought these poor Indians in Wisconsin who get 6000 a year versus the Indians in Minnesota that make $400,000 a year per person, and he raises $420,000 for the Democratic campaign, sits next to the president the night before Secretary Babbitt uh, makes the decision, and uh, most secretaries, including Babbitt, have approved Indian gaming. Uh, he was ordered by the White House to disapprove this particular uh, application. And uh, this has wrecked that tribe's chance for the opportunity in health care, schools, you name it, clinics. Uh, is that under investigation? Yes, sir. Uh, FBI agents and task force attorneys, in terms of the preliminary investigation, are conducting that. I've uh, discussed the matter with the Attorney General. I'm sure I'll discuss it again with her before she makes any final decisions. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Director. I uh, join with other members of this committee in saluting you for your uh, independence. And I've joined many members of this committee for about seven hours and two days of, of discussions and questions. And I think we've covered a lot of territory. and. Uh, many questions have been asked several times. And I think I know the answer to this question, at, at least I hope I know the answer because of your reputation. 
but uh, could you tell us, for the record, did you or anyone in coordination with you uh, leak the contents or sense of the memo to the Attorney General? No, sir. Nobody, uh, nobody associated with me, as far as I know and believe, uh, unless I'm shown otherwise. Well, that's, that's the answer I was hoping for, and I'm uh, glad we got it on the record. Thank you. Uh, now, you mentioned in response to Mr. Cummings' question that uh, you would deal with Mr. Bennett because he represents uh, the committee, and as I'm sure you know, he represents the majority of the committee, uh, and I, I would say represents them well. Uh, I would ask you to include minority counsel in any further discussions uh, you or your counsel may have with this committee. Uh, is this something that you could do? We will talk to uh, anybody on the committee, uh, either members or councils uh, on either side with respect to the, uh, certainly the, uh, the matter with respect to the memo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kucinich uh, yields back the balance of his time. Uh, I would like to uh, take my five minutes, if I might, right this minute. Uh, you know, Mr. Freed, uh, Donald Schmaltz, the independent counsel that's uh, been investigating the Department of Agriculture affair? Yes, sir. Uh, can you give us uh, your opinion of his uh, his uh, capability, qualifications, what kind of a guy he is? He's going to be before us later today. Um, I've worked uh, with Mr. Schmaltz uh, since about 1994 when the matter under inquiry was referred to him. He, um, uh, in my view, is an outstanding attorney. He's a former federal prosecutor, as you know. He's a law professor. Uh, he's one of the, uh, uh, the finest lawyers I've worked with. And uh, as you know, he's had... FBI agents uh, separated from the FBI assigned to his inquiry for many months and all of our dealings have been uh, professional and I have great uh, respect for him. He's done an outstanding job, in uh, your opinion. I'm, well, without commenting on, on the work that he's done since I'm removed from the substance of the work, my view of him as a, an attorney and a prosecutor is, uh, is extremely high. Thank you. There was an article written by Bob Novak and I want to read to you from this article. It says, a veteran FBI agent resigned and retired from the government in September after refusing a demand by Attorney General Janet Reno to give the Justice Department the names of highly sensitive secret China contacts. This sent a wave of outrage coursing through the Bureau and will surely prompt new congressional concerns about Reno. Ray Wickman, former head of the FBI's intelligence unit monitoring Chinese operations, was reached at his home in suburban Washington and told me, I took my retirement, but he refused to say more. However, well-placed and outraged bureau sources said Wickman's resignation was his only recourse because of the Justice Department's threatened compromise of FBI intelligence. It was an insult, a veteran FBI agent told me. Months of confusion over FBI and Justice Department investigation of alleged Chinese attempts to influence American politics was the subject that uh, Justice was looking at. High level, I'm going to leave some of this out. High-level officials at the FBI and the Justice Department, when asked what happened, put out the story on a not-for-attribution basis. When Wickman decided to resign, he was asked to turn in his sources on the Chinese account, but declined to do so because he was concerned about their low quality. That sounds like bureaucratic nonsense. And close colleagues of Wickman in the Bureau said it certainly is. They report that Wickman quit after, not before he refused to turn over his sources. Far from being of low quality, the Chinese sources and the intelligence derived from them are regarded by FBI professionals as the best in the Bureau. What's more, they consider these files as the most sensitive kept by the FBI. Uh, the Justice Department, clearly on Reno's orders, was demanding raw files sent shockwaves through the Bureau. The purpose of the FBI is to safeguard sources, a senior FBI agent appalled by the Wickman affair told me. And it says nobody uh, in the FBI will talk on the record. And I understand that Senator Specter uh, is likely to have uh, some closed door uh, hearings with you and others on this. Now, you were asked earlier about this, and you said you had no knowledge of it. Uh, since that time that you were asked about this, I'm sure you've looked into it because Mr. Wickman was one of your leading investigators. Can you tell us uh, the circumstances surrounding this? With respect to, uh, first of all, I know Mr. Wickman uh, from several years of working with him, and in fact, I presented his 25-year uh, key to him not too long ago. Uh, he has never told me, and I think he has the kind of relationship with me that uh, he could. He's never told me or complained to me uh, or said anything to me which indicated 
Uh, he was leaving uh, for any other reason except that he wanted to retire. I extended him beyond the mandatory retirement age of 57 uh, so he could stay. He was certainly welcome, uh, from my point of view, to stay. Um, I know he's spoken to Senator Specter. I, I understand he's going to speak to this committee. Um, I have heard, as you have heard, uh, this notion that uh, he left because he was unhappy because he was forced to turn over files. I certainly don't uh, know of any basis, in fact, for that. Does the idea has, have any have any agents in your department in any way in any way inferred that that's factual to you? No, in fact, they've come back to me upon my inquiry and said, no, he's uh, said that he's retired because he wanted to retire and did not retire because he felt uh, forced. The other thing, excuse me, if I just say, the idea that he was told to turn in his sources uh, is a nonsensical notion. We don't have, FBI agents don't have sources that are not official sources with files. You don't, when you leave the FBI, take those sources with you. In fact, you're not supposed to have a source that's not set up and documented according to our guidelines. So that would not be... That would not be a, 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 a realistic so, situation. So, so no, nobody uh, in the FBI has inferred in, in, in any way that he was distraught or concerned about possible leaks of uh, intelligence sources that he had that might be in jeopardy uh, if they were turned over to the Justice Department? No, I have heard uh, other people have reported to me that when he left, he was, uh, he, was not, uh, he was not altogether happy about certain things, but nobody has told me, and I've asked this question uh, several times, uh, that he left because he was being uh, told to hand in any sources. I understand that nobody may have told you that, but what I'm trying to find out is, uh, have any agents or anybody at the Bureau indicated that he was dissatisfied with the Justice Department regarding their inquiry into his sources? No, sir. You have no knowledge of that? I have heard, as you have heard, and apparently as a reporter has heard, that he made complaints to people uh, that he was unhappy with his, uh, with his assignment. But when I asked people to get the facts and report back to me, they told me that that was not the case, that he retired because he was beyond his mandatory age and, and wanted to retire. Well, all I can tell you is that I, I know Mr. Novak, and I see my time's expired, and uh, he has talked, uh, according to him in his article, uh, with FBI agents who have verified the things that I just mentioned to you. And uh, if that is true, uh, I wish you'd look into it because you are the head of the FBI and uh, this committee and I would like to know if there's any credence to what's been said. Yes, I will look into it and... Uh, would you report back to me? And I will it's, report it's back. sensitive information that should not be made public, you may rest assured that it will not be made public, but I'd like to know about that. We're cleared for top secret, and if there's any indication whatsoever that there was some concern about uh, sources that are giving us information regarding the Chinese... Uh, 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 in uh, 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 giving contributions to uh, people in this country, and we know from reports in the Washington Post that the Chinese government has been giving contributions to political people in this country, and if there was some kind of a threat to any of those sources, it's imperative that the Congress know about that, and we can keep that secret, but we need to look into it. Uh, okay. Who's next on your side? I'll report back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Turner? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield to Mr. Lantos for a minute. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, conclude on uh, this exchange between Mr. Burton and yourself. Uh, during your entire testimony, you were never as animated as you were in response to this. And basically, uh, Director Free, you are denying the validity of this Bob Novak story. Is that correct, sir? As far as I'm concerned, I don't have any basis in fact. I think what we need to do, uh, you know, is talk to the people with uh, first-hand knowledge right. and direct knowledge, and uh, I'll report back to you. Uh, could, I, could I ask you, what is the mandatory retirement age? 57. When did this gentleman retire? I know he was extended for a year. So uh, he was over 57. Yes, he was over 57. Right. So what we are dealing with is, is another off-the-wall Bob Novak story. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Well, look, it's, it, you've raised a serious issue. It's a serious issue that when it was raised in the article, uh, I asked that people make inquiry, and I've gotten back. As far as I have seen it, I haven't seen a written report, but as far as I've been told, uh, he did not leave because he was being forced to turn over files. And the notion that he had sources that 
uh, he took with him, it's, that's just not, our, that's not the way we do business. I will uh, conduct further inquiry. Um, I have been reluctant to call Mr. Wickman myself. I have not done that. Let me see if I can get some more facts for you and I'll report back to you. It's a serious enough allegation that I'll, I'll look into it more fully. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Director Free, I uh, know you have a unique perspective on the campaign finance system, and as you know, there are many of us who are working very hard to reform that system. Uh, we believe that the campaign contribution limits ought to be meaningful, that there shouldn't be a system that's a dual system where we tell folks they can give $1,000 to a candidate, but if they want to give 100000 in so-called soft money to a party or a nonprofit group, that's okay. Uh, you've seen it all. You've investigated, I'm sure, hundreds of cases. Uh, is there, in your opinion, is there any doubt in your mind that soft money is being used to influence the election and re-election of candidates for federal office? Um, as I said yesterday, it's, um, it's an area that I don't think is appropriate for me to give an opinion on because I am the investigator who's trying to determine whether uh, people uh, either intentionally or unwittingly uh, crossed lines or boundaries or violated statutes. I don't think uh, my experience in the criminal investigation uh, is really relevant to uh, the statutory scheme, and I don't think it's, it's, a, it's appropriate for the director to be giving an opinion on that. Well, with, without stating opinion as to whether you think it's good or bad, I mean, in terms of your investigation, have you seen what we call soft money uh, influencing the outcome of elections in this country? I'd just rather not uh, comment on that. All right. uh, a little bit earlier, you were asked some questions about uh, the FBI's um, being some of the agents saying they were maybe hindered in uh, the timing of their investigation because the Independent Counsel Act hadn't been triggered and therefore they couldn't move forward as quickly as maybe they wanted to. Uh, do you recall that testimony yes. earlier? Uh, without discussing the specifics of any evidence, was there any indication that any evidence was covered up, altered, or compromised by any delay? It's almost an impossible question to answer. I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, don't uh, please don't uh, infer from from that that uh, that there was. I just I, I don't think you could calculate an answer that would be accurate. Well, there's no you have no personal knowledge that there was any evidence covered up, altered, or compromised by virtue of the delay. You have no personal knowledge of it. Uh, from a criminal point of view. Yes. No. No would personal the, knowledge. Would the gentleman yield? Could you expand upon that? I'll give the gentleman more time. Uh, you said not from a criminal point of view. Was there cover up in any other area? Well, my inquiry is a, is a criminal inquiry. Gentleman, more time. I think you're begging the issue, Mr. Free. Was there a cover up in any other area? That's not the question that was asked. Well, I'm asking the question. Cover up in terms of a criminal act no, or? In any area that you think was relevant. No. Mr. Free, you had stated in your testimony the other day that on the issues of fact, the Attorney General and I do not disagree. Was that your testimony yes. yesterday? I'm reading from a press report, the reason I'm inquiring again. The Attorney General, in her finding regarding the Vice President's phone calls from the White House from federal property, concluded that there are, was no uh, basis for concluding that his phone calls were solicitations for hard money. Uh, that was a factual determination. Uh, is it fair to, to say that you do not disagree with the Attorney General regarding her fact findings? Well, your, your question I'm sorry, the, with respect to the, the facts that were developed in regard to that aspect of the investigation, yes. there's no dispute about what the facts are. 
All right, that's what I was trying to yes. clarify, that, that you had no disagreement regarding the factual findings, but rather your disagreement was regarding the interpretation of the independent counsel law. The disagreement was in the ultimate recommendation. Right. Yes. Now, does the independent counsel statute require the attorney general to consult with the FBI? No. But in this instance, because of her regard for you, she sought out your opinion. She sought it out. And how much time elapsed between the time you gave her your opinion and the time that she actually issued her opinion? As I indicated before, these discussions have been ongoing for many, many months. With respect to the, uh, the memo in question, uh, I provided that to her about a week before her final decision. And you felt like that was sufficient time for her to give your opinion? Yes, because uh, we had been discussing these issues for a long period of time. So again, your disagreement was like two lawyers may agree, disagree on the interpretation of the law. That's a, that's a good characteristic of Rather it. Rather than any disagreement about the facts that, that uh, the two of you uh, looked at. We did not dispute the facts. And in fact, as the FBI director, it's your role to fi find and investigate and provide the facts. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. And it's her role to interpret and, and, and determine what the law is that should be applied to the facts that you provide. Yes. Is that a fair characterization of what the appropriate roles of the FBI director is and the attorney general? Yes. And I believe you stated earlier that you uh, respected her judgment, even though, as lawyers, you may have had a, a little different take regarding what the law said. That's correct. Has anybody ever been prosecuted under this 1883 uh, Pendleton Act for making a campaign solicitation from federal property? Um, there's been some. Uh, there's been some prosecution because there's some case law on it. Uh, but I think, I, I don't know exactly the, the cases or the statutes. I think there's some, there's some case law. There, there are four precedents, I'm, I'm told, under the statute, but not with this factual scenario. Uh, and was, were those telephone calls, solicitations of campaign contributions, or do they relate back to the uh, historical basis for putting that into the law in 1883, which said you shouldn't have officials going around button holding, holding their employees on the job to get money out of them for their campaign and their reelections. I, I don't know offhand. I know the Supreme Court case is quite old, the one that talks about the statute. The gentleman uh, this time has expired. Thank I, you, I Mr. granted Chairman. him some additional time because of my, uh, my interruption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Free, uh, you're also uh, charged with upholding the uh, law. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, it's my understanding this committee uh, issued you a subpoena, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, it's my also, also my understanding that the deadline for complying that, with that subpoena for the request of document was yesterday at noon, is that correct? That's correct. So at this time, you're uh, technically in contempt of our request and uh, uh, similar action is taken by the uh, the Attorney General, I told her yesterday, I tell you today, that uh, if there is not compliance, I will uh, seek uh, contempt of Congress, uh, uh, both against the Attorney General and against uh, you uh, for not complying. Um, I'm hoping that we don't have to do that, and I'm glad to hear the message that was delivered uh, first thing by you this morning from the Attorney General, that we, we don't have to proceed in that fashion, because we are willing to work with you. Uh, we have. We're not interested in uh, everything you have on the investigation. But you have to understand, uh, Director, where we're coming from. And I consider myself a strong uh, advocate of the FBI and law enforcement. But uh, uh, I've sat here now through uh, Travelgate, uh, where they, we saw the attempted misuse of uh, the FBI. I sat here through Filegate, where we saw the abuse by the White House of the FBI. Uh, I just saw. Uh, the Thompson hearings and uh, and suddenly uh, the cache of information suddenly appear in and some of it from what I've read in press accounts in conflict to closed door briefings that were given to us and we should discuss that later Mr. Chairman because it uh, raised some serious questions about national 
security and interference with our political uh, system from foreign entities. Um, but understand where I'm coming from. We are not a legislative, we're not an appropriations committee of Congress. We were set up in 1808 by the Founding Fathers to conduct investigations and oversight. And we're learning things from news accounts. I mean, <laughs> our best sources are the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times. Uh, uh, I'm st stunned uh, to read uh, that the, the Attorney General said the, that uh, uh, we could provide, a, or you'd be providing a roadmap. She'd be providing us with a roadmap to the investigation that, and the uh, the Wall Street Journal says the FBI director still secret memo advocating an outside prosecutor claims the Democrats' diversion of party building funds into campaign accounts may have constituted a conspiracy reaching into the White House. Among other possible crimes, he cited misuse, uh, misuse of government resources and obstructing justice. Now, again, this is just a press account, but you have to understand where we're coming from, that this raises great uh, questions about what's no, going I understand on that. and leaks. So uh, that's one reason why, if they're press accounts, we should see at least part of what's going on. The other thing, too, is we don't want to duplicate investigations. You have criminal responsibility. We have congressional responsibility. So it's important that we know uh, something of what's going on and make, making certain that this scandal is... Uh, is properly uh, investigated. Uh, have any of your agents uh, conducted any investigations in Indonesia, China, or Thailand? Yes, Sorry. we've had leads as well as uh, direct investigation done in, in many of those areas. In all three countries? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly in all three countries, but certainly in, uh, in that region and one or more of the countries. We've been actively pursuing that through our legats overseas. I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, and incidentally, you said you've issued more than 1,000 subpoenas, so you've surpassed us by uh, th over 300. And you're not paying attention to whether these are Republican accusations or Democrat accusations, are you? Okay, good no. to hear that. One thing, your job is to uphold the law, and I, I reported to the Attorney General, or started it, uh, to report investigation we've conducted on possible violations of uh, federal code. And uh, if we could uh, provide uh, the, the uh, FBI director with uh, one, two, three, four, five, possible six federal violations and one state violations. As I indicated yesterday, Kansas instituted a, a law, and a lot about this is about complying with laws already on the books, but Kansas instituted a, a law to limit the amount of uh, federal money coming into their state, soft money. And I have a list of conduit payments in Kansas, which is absolutely outrageous. 17 uh, uh, states contributed money in conduit fashion to Kansas election in, uh, in con uh, conflict with their law, and uh, I think in violation of s at least uh, five federal statutes. Uh, can I have your assurance that this matter will be investigated? Yes, sir. Let me ask you one other question. I've heard, and I'm concerned that there, there and I outlined yesterday for the Attorney General what I see as a conspiracy in this whole, uh, this whole uh, campaign financing scheme from the federal uh, level and possibly from the White House. Uh, there are provisions of the RICO statute for investigation, and some of this, uh, uh, some of this activity may now border on uh, uh, a racketeering or a conspiracy. Uh, do you think that the RICO statute may be invoked uh, in, in uh, your investigation? I, I don't think I could comment on that at this time. Has my time expired? Gentlemen's time has expired. If Chairman, I have a parliamentary. If, if you would uh, like to answer, was the question answered? I didn't hear. We allow Mr. Director Free to answer the question. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I can't comment on that at this time. What statutes might ultimately be implicated here, if any? Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, you may state your parliament. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Micah indicated that he would was intending to uh, seek contempt of Congress against um, Mr. Free for Mr. Free's. Um, failing, according to Mr. Micah, to comply 
with this, the subpoena. Mr. Free has indicated, obviously, that he feels this would hamper the current investigation. Under the rules, how many business days notice is required? I, I feel very strongly that we should not hamper this investigation, and for that reason, I would vote against that for, motion of contempt, for, and I want to make all, sure that my Let me just say that's a moot point because uh, that's something that uh, the chair is not considering at this time. Uh, the this option, is a parliamentary inquiry for my, for my knowledge. How many prior days? The gentleman will uh, wait just a moment. I'll check. It would be three business days. I will be here if he does that. Just so Obviously, we would probably all be here, but uh, that's something that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're is under consideration, but we're not uh, making any moves in that direction. We're hoping, as uh, Director Free has stated earlier, that we can work this out between his counsel and the Attorney General's counsel and Mr. Bennett so that we get uh, the information, uh, albeit in a redacted manner. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Uh, I, uh, he made a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, if you have a parliamentary inquiry, you may state it. Uh, well, it's, it's in connection with your statement. You said that uh, it's under consideration. Well, we have not closed any options regarding the subpoenas that were sent to the Attorney General and to the FBI Director. But as a chairman, can you inform the members why it's under consideration? I, I, the chairman, the chair is not going to get into the, 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 the negotiations that are taking place at the present time or will be taking place. Members of the committee will be informed if we're, if we're contemplating taking any action. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Free, you said a moment ago that you, you investigate uh, equally, or, or let me put it, it makes no difference to you whether allegations are about democratic abuses or republican abuses. You, you consider it your responsibility to investigate both. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. That yes, sir. is very important because that is not what we are doing in this committee. Uh, on this committee, all of the depositions and all of the interrogatories have been directed to democratic targets. And there have been 373 subpoenas issued. 364 of them have been directed to Democratic targets and not to Republican targets. There have been 178 requests for documents and 177 of those requests were related to Democratic fundraising abuses and only one to Republican fundraising abuses. I mean, the fact is, it is unfortunate, but this committee's investigation has been far more about politics than about reform. The, I am. I'm new to Washington. This is my, my first year. And one thing strikes me from uh, what I've seen and heard here in this past year. That is how, how quickly people are willing to attribute motives to you or to anyone else in this, in this city and how quickly they will change allegiances. Uh, you've come under attack from leading Republicans for the Jewel case, the problems with forensic labs, for Ruby Ridge, and then last week when your memo was being discussed, the same people were singing your praises. I noticed in the paper uh, uh, just, uh, just the other day, when your memo was released, there were, people were attributing motives to you that had to do with your ability to engage in bureaucratic infighting, and there was a suggestion yesterday that now you're trying to appease uh, Janet Reno in this administration. What strikes me is that they're all wrong and that basically you're here trying to do your job, trying to take the information that you get and make the best possible decisions. And the, the suggestion that the, the speed with which people attribute motives in this city is uh, astonishing. I am concerned about two things here. Uh, first, I want all of us to get to the bottom of any fundraising abuses in 1996 and 1994, any cases where the law was violated. And second, I want to see real campaign finance reform this, in this term of Congress. You can't help with the second, but you are critically important to the first. And so the only uh, thing I would ask is that whenever you feel that, that uh, you are being subjected to political pressure from Demo from Democrats or from Republicans that you will speak up, that you will let me know, that you will let people on this committee know, that you will let the public know so that we can stop it uh, before, before it continues. And I would just, my only question, sir, is will you do that? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time.
The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. McIntosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me commend you on the excellent way in which you've conducted these hearings in being fair and impartial to all sides, and I want to thank you for doing that. Second, I really have one question for you, Director Fried, and then I want to yield my, the rest of my time to Mr. Barr. I guess a question and a statement. The, the question for you is, and, and I don't think you meant this, but I want to be sure, you, you don't believe that because a law is an old law on the books for over 100 years that that is a reason that people shouldn't obey it and fully enforce it in the law enforcement agencies? No, I, mean, I don't. No, I didn't speak about that law at all, but no, not at all. Constitution's even older. Exactly. And, and I think we share that value. I find it shameful that, that the president and the vice president and some of their supporters are implying that because it's an old law, it's been on the books a long time, it shouldn't apply to them today in its full extent. And that leads me to my general point. I want to say thank you for being willing to stand up against political pressure. And I know what it's like to serve in an administration where you need to be loyal and do what you think is right. I am offended by the Attorney General's decision not to appoint an independent counsel. And the worst thing about it is that it sends a message to the young people in America that the President and the Vice President might be getting away with something and nobody's going to appoint an independent investigator to find out if that's true. And I think that is wrong. It is a terrible message for this Attorney General to send. And I appreciate the candor with which you advised her to make that appointment. And I appreciate your reluctance to bring that out in the public because you have to be able to give advice to your superiors. But I want to say thank you for standing up for that principle. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Free, uh, uh, unfortunately, as, as in many things, uh, just saying things in law enforcement uh, don't make it so. Uh, the Attorney General just saying that she's going to follow evidence wherever it leads doesn't make it so. Now, it may or may not turn out to be the case, but just saying something over and over and over again doesn't mean it. Uh, saying that there is no public political interference doesn't make it so. Saying that you are going to be independent does not make it so. Actions do, in fact, speak louder than words. Uh, I am somewhat concerned because I think there has been political interference with the FBI during this administration, uh, and I don't think that in several instances there has been independence exercised. Uh, I think independence, for example, is when uh, there is a crime, evidence of a crime, even the possibility of it at the highest levels of government in which in information may be destroyed, independence means the FBI secures a crime scene, as was done in the Iran Gate. Uh, uh, matter. Uh, not that uh, uh, people are allowed to take information out that there apparently is no effort made to secure a crime scene. To me, that's not independence. Uh, to me, independence would be when somebody from the White House seeks to obtain access to very sensitive files on American citizens. Independence means asking some very tough questions about why those files uh, are sought, under what circumstances they will be maintained, that there be follow-up to make sure that those strictures are, are, are complied with. Uh, and independence does not mean uh, that dozens and then hundreds of files, uh, sensitive files, on law-abiding American citizens, by all accounts, are turned over to political operatives. Independence, I don't think, means that when a former distinguished agent, such as Gary Aldrich, or let's say John Doe, submits a manuscript uh, to the FBI, uh, and people at the FBI send it over to the White House uh, for political reasons so that they can run their spin on it and prepare to take care of any embarrassing information that may be in it, that is not independence. Uh, and that indicates uh, a far too close political relationship between uh, the Bureau uh, and an administration. That's what I see. And despite your protestations that uh, you are independent and there is no interference, uh, the record bespeaks that there are problems. Uh, with regard to uh, the current situation uh, that we have, also I was, I was rather astounded to hear yesterday uh, your interpretation of uh, 28, uh, uh, well, the, the authority under which the director of FBI is appointed uh, states very clearly uh, in law passed in 1976 that the tenure of the director of the FBI is 10 years. And if one goes back and looks at why that was done, it was done precisely so the president could not just fire some a director of the FBI for political reasons. 
uh, that there has to be a reason. Independence to me would be if, if, an, if the director of, uh, of the FBI is asked, can the president just fire you because he wants to, independence would mean saying no, but hell no, the president cannot do that. I will not tolerate uh, that happening. If there is good cause for a president to terminate the director of the FBI, then certainly. Uh, but I, I just don't understand why you seem to be going out of your way to show lack of independence in some of these things. Uh, with regard to the memo that we're talking about, uh, I understand uh, as a former prosecutor that there are reasons why every communication between a director of the FBI and an attorney general are not to be made public. But to rely and to play into, to some extent, the attempts to trivialize this issue on the other side, that this is just a disagreement among two lawyers, is not accurate. You're not just another lawyer. You're not paid just to be another lawyer. Uh, you are the director of the FBI. Uh, and I will follow up on, on that because I do have a couple of specific questions during my time. Uh, and I thank the gentleman from Indiana Can for you. Can I respond, Mr. Chairman? Okay. You may um, respond, to Director Free. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, with respect to uh, uh, your concerns about the FBI's independence, uh, no one has a greater concern about them than I do. I think it's important to distinguish, however, between events that happen and the perception or interpretation of independence and the actual factual uh, issues surrounding uh, motive and intent. I think there's two slices to independence. There's what may be perceived uh, to be actions which are not independent, turning over uh, FBI files, for instance, but turning them over uh, in a process that was 28 years old and started under the Johnson administration and which was fixed immediately by this director as soon as it came to his attention. So I think we have to be very careful about distinguishing between the perception of independence uh, or non-independence and what actually uh, is at stake and uh, the facts regarding motive uh, and independence. Uh, I am not going out of my way to uh, trivialize or play down uh, or emphasize uh, my independence one way or the other. I, uh, I call the shots as I see them. My job is not to please anyone uh, in this town uh, at the expense of doing what I think is required by my duty. Uh, if uh, uh, things that I do or things that the FBI do uh, does from time to time interferes with that perception, that's my fault. I have to try to correct that. But uh, I am uh, appropriately and politically independent and I stake uh, all of my integrity on that. Mr. Sinanu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Director Free. Yes, thank you very much for being here and addressing the, the questions people have offered in uh, such a direct way. Uh, yesterday, the Attorney General indicated uh, in her testimony that she has not initiated a 30-day preliminary investigation as to whether or not an independent counsel is appropriate in the matter of Webster-Hubble and uh, uh, payments uh, involved uh, other allegations of illegality that I know you're investigating. Is that your understanding, that no 30-day inquiry uh, has been initiated? That's correct. You worked with Mr. Hubble in 93 and 94 at Justice, is that correct? He was at Justice while I was FBI Director. And what was your working relationship? Well, as the, um, as the Associate Attorney General, he had very uh, little to do with the uh, FBI in terms of uh, my issues and what I dealt with from time to time on different issues. Uh, we would be involved with him, but um, we work uh, primarily with the, uh, of course, the Attorney General, the Deputy, and the Head of the Criminal Division. Given that level of interaction, do you think you personally would have a conflict of interest in investigating matters related to Webster Hubble? No, sir. Uh, do you think the Attorney General, uh, in her working relationship, uh, previous working relationship, would have a conflict of interest with the investigation of Webster Hubble? I think only she can make that determination. You're aware of uh, Webster Hubble's relationships with James Riotti, um, John Wong, and uh, others related in the campaign uh, finance allegations, correct? I'm aware of uh, reports and uh, facts involving those matters, yes. Uh, have you had discussions with people in Department of Justice about potential conflicts of interest? No. With respect to Mr. With Hubble? With respect to Mr. Hubble and, and people in the uh, Department of Justice investigating uh, the your former uh, number two uh, employee at the Department of Justice. No, I have not. I, I would only make the comment that uh, it would seem to me 
given his uh, past history of working with uh, people very closely in the department, that this would represent, at least within the Department of Justice and the Attorney General's office, a pretty clear case where uh, the perception and the reality of a conflict in the investigation uh, might exist. And it would seem very appropriate, appropriate at a minimum to initiate a 30-day inquiry as to whether or not a special prosecutor, an independent counsel, uh, would be appropriate. I want to ask just a couple of questions about the use of immunity. Uh, you're a former judge. You're obviously very familiar with the use of Im immunity, more so than I am sure. Uh, it is common, is it not, to use immunity uh, with lower-level witnesses uh, in an attempt to gather valuable information in prosecuting higher-level members of an organization? That's a common procedure, yeah. Um, are you aware that uh, the Department of Justice initially opposed immunity for a, a group of nuns uh, that wanted to provide testimony regarding uh, conduit payments, straw donor payments? Is that correct? I'm aware of that. Did any uh, agents uh, that you're aware of express concern about the justice's reluctance uh, to allow immunity to, to be used in that case? No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, do you think that uh, their reluctance, Department of Justice's reluctance to use immunity in that case, uh, did that strike you as uncommon or unusual given their uh, the nuns' background, uh, their willingness to, uh, to work with the uh, committees in their investigation? Um, I, I don't think I can make a determination on that. You know, the, the issues of competing uh, witnesses or subjects and how that relates to decisions to immunize or not immunize are, first of all, not decisions that, that we make in the FBI, and uh, I was not privy to the conversations or the process in the department on that issue. But it didn't strike you as unusual that there was such reluctance with these particular witnesses? I, I, don't, I don't really have a reaction one way or the other without knowing the facts and being privy to the issues involved. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the balance of my time to Mr. Micah. Real quickly, uh, Mr. Free, uh, you stated uh, uh, to us that while candidly there are startup problems and growing pains uh, in, in uh, this uh, task force you put together, it's my understanding that uh, a new U.S. attorney attorney was uh, recently brought in. Who's that? Uh, uh, Charles Labello, who was the first assistant out in San Diego. How long have you known him? I've known him many years. We were uh, uh, prosecutors together in the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York for several years. Is there any uh, reason Mr. Labella couldn't uh, run an, an investigation as an independent or special counsel rather than uh, uh, at the Justice Department? Whether he could be an independent counsel? Right. I think the statute actually prohibits uh, Department of Justice employees from being oh, appointed. Oh, if he was appointed, uh, if we had an independent counsel, he, wouldn't he make a good one? I think he'd be outstanding. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the problems I have is I've learned that there's already co some conflicts with Mr. Labella. Uh, he's already clashed with Lee uh, Raddick, the head of public integrity. And uh, I understand Mr. Raddick is a very turf-conscious uh, individual and wanting to maintain control of, the or, uh, of this investigation. Uh, what's going on? Um, I don't think it's, it's appropriate for me to comment uh, on relationships between any of the uh, prosecutors involved. What I can comment on and what I'll be happy to talk about is uh, what can the you, FBI is doing and whether our... Could you just then describe maybe the chain of command uh, for us? Um, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Labella reports to uh, Mr. Radick. Mr. Radick um, uh, is the head of the public integrity section, and then uh, from there it goes up to uh, uh, Mark Richard, who's the a acting attorney, uh, assistant attorney general in this matter, uh, and then up to the attorney general. And uh, finally, uh, your relationship with Mr. Labella, you said that goes back a long ways. Uh, yes, we know each other very well. And uh, what capacity? Uh, we were both uh, prosecutors, assistant U.S. attorneys in the Southern District of New York, uh, going back from 1980 to 1991. We had different cases, but we knew each other very well. Thank you for your cooperation. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Lantos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since Mr. Micah uh, referred uh, 
to the director a matter pertaining to Kansas. I'd like to refer to a matter pertaining to Montana. Triad Management Services, a secretive organization funded by ultra-wealthy, ultra-conservatives, funneled millions of dollars into issue ads into congressional races through two nonprofit organizations. Um, we are requesting you, uh, Mr. Director, to look into this case as you are looking into the Kansas case yeah. mentioned by my colleague. Yeah. Let me look at the facts and I'll review uh, it. We appreciate that. I want to deal with the contempt issue that has now been raised on several occasions. Uh, and I would like Mr. Burton to pay attention. One of the problems we have had with this uh, committee procedure throughout this entire investigation is that the committee has not operated on a bipartisan basis. The subpoenas issued to the Attorney General and the Director of the FBI uh, we were never, never consulted on, we never participated in, and unanimously our side rejects the appropriateness of the subpoenas. Um, now, since the subpoenas, according to Mr. Micah, uh, have now run their course, and both the Attorney General uh, and the Director are technically uh, uh, in contempt of Congress, and, and you, Mr. Chairman, indicated you are not excluding anything. Let me state for the record, and I speak for our side unanimously, uh, that we think that the notion of a contempt citation that might be issued against the Attorney General or the Director of the FBI because they are determined to uphold their oath of office is preposterous beyond words. And I am convinced that should such an outrageous course of action be attempted, there will be a unanimous vote on the part of the Democrats opposing it. I want to thank you, Mr. Director, for your excellent testimony. Uh, as always, you have uh, conducted yourself with dignity and professionalism, and uh, we are all hoping that you will continue in your capacity as director of the FBI as long as you choose. I yield back the balance. Uh, I'll the be happy to yield to my friend, uh, uh, Congressman Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Lantos. Uh, picking up on what uh, Congressman Lantos just said, uh, moments ago, we heard the chairman of the committee relate that he was, in fact, considering uh, contempt of Congress charges, um, alluded to negotiations. When I asked the question, the chair could not respond as to why. I would hope, and I've hoped this from the beginning of these proceedings, that members of this committee, particularly the chair, would be very slow in making statements that could be considered to be quite provocative, uh, statements that have serious consequences. I have a background in the media. I uh, have a master's in communications. I've worked on the other side here. Of people are writing and behind the cameras. I've, I've done that work. I know that when the chairman of a committee says the words, we are considering contempt of Congress charges. That has impact. You write it down, you report it to the American people. But unfortunately, what doesn't happen is there's not a process here which substantiates chapter and verse as to why that statement should even be made. So when we go through this whole exercise of hearings, uh, we in the Congress, uh, the administration, people in the media and the general public. I think that we must be very careful in using the uh, accusations, uh, the nuances of accusation, the rhetoric of condemnation, 
Uh, we are an investigative body, and as an investigative body, we have to be prudent in our use of terms, just as the director is prudent, and just as the attorney general has been very prudent in not releasing information which would smear someone. The process of government is a very powerful process, and as the wheels move, it can affect people's lives. It can affect their reputations. It can have an impact on their service. And so as one member of this committee, I just feel it's my obligation with the experience that I have in saying that we should be very careful about the terms that we use, about the actions that we say we would take, so as not to inflame a situation or to smear someone who is serving this country. Thank you. The gentleman's time has Mr. expired. Chairman. Three three quick points before I yield to our last uh, last uh, speaker. First of all, the minority and majority council are uh, working on and awaiting more information from the Senate committee who's seeding us information on triad. There will be, uh, as I said before, an investigation into the triad matter, number one. Number two, the minority did get 24 hours notice on the subpoenas in question in accordance with our protocol. And third, we are trying to work things out with the Department of Justice Council and the FBI Director's Council regarding this memorandum. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to the memo, uh, Mr. Free, it is not your position that it is not being provided because of an assertion of executive privilege. Is that correct? As far as I know, that's not been asserted yet. Correct. Okay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the Attorney General explicitly said that yesterday, that, it, that the refusal to comply with it was not based on a claim of executive privilege. Is that correct? I believe she did. Right. Uh, let me uh, uh, ask a, a couple of questions here and, and to follow up on where I began uh, before. Uh, you're not paid by the citizens of this country to be just another lawyer. Uh, you are paid to head up a very large, very sophisticated, and very fine investigative agency. I would say the best in the world. Uh, and therefore, when questions are asked of you, they're not asked of you, at least in this context here, uh, as Mr. Louis Free, member of the bar. Uh, and we are not interested in what two lawyers in private practice or in some prosecutorial office may disagree on from time to time. These matters are a slight deal more important than that, and the background and responsibility that you bring to answering those questions is more than just another lawyer. Uh, so I, I really uh, don't appreciate efforts by certain people on the other side to trivialize this into just, this is just another disagreement. It's not just another disagreement. Uh, we are asking uh, questions, and the American people are asking questions, legitimately so, that go to the heart of whether or not we're going to have accountability on the part of our top leaders whether or not there is, there is credible, specific evidence that, uh, that people in the highest levels of our government may have violated laws. Those are very serious questions, and I would hope that when you provide advice to the Attorney General, to the President, uh, or your people, you're providing advice not just as another member of the bar. Uh, it's also based on vast experience that you have, very distinguished experience as a federal judge, as a federal prosecutor. Uh, and that background, close to two dozen years, as you indicated yesterday, uh, is really a great deal of background, more than many other people uh, currently in government have. Uh, and I do have a, a fairly substantive question about that, but uh, what to do with that. Uh, but let me ask just a couple of quick questions. Did the FBI do any investigation with regard to Larry Lawrence and his background? Larry who? Larry Lawrence, the fellow uh, about the yes, controversy um, at Arlington Cemetery. Did we do the ambassador, John? Yeah. Yeah, we don't do the background investigations for ambassadors. We probably did name checks and national security checks. Okay, would a name check have disclosed that, uh, that this gentleman apparently falsified records uh, regarding his educational and, and supposed military background? Depends what records we had related to the name. I, I don't know what they were at this point. But, but we, we would not be the people going out doing the background and checking the military records. We would simply check that name against our Who, who does that? State Department State, in that case? Yes, yeah, State Department, I'm told. Okay, if you had, I presume that, uh, that uh, the FBI would not be satisfied with, with just what they might uh, find. If questions are raised, they would check further, wouldn't they? The background investigations we do for uh, Senate confirmees, confirmees are, are exhaustive. It's the same background that I receive, and uh, they go beyond uh, interviews and so beyond. So if the FBI conducted a background check on Mr. Lawrence, uh, would we be correct in presuming that uh, these discrepancies, shall we say, would have been uncovered? 
we would we would do the fullest uh, and most complete background that we could. <laughs> I really, you're, you're shortchanging the FBI. I, I think that they would have been. I mean, I like you to say think with we, some degree of certainty that, well, yes, the FBI is good enough that we would have uncovered that? I like to think that we would. Okay. Uh, and if, if you would have, would those facts have been made known to those that were putting this man forward as for this high position? Yes, that would be reported to the White House. Uh, does the FBI, is the FBI, have they been asked to do any background checks on welfare people who under the welfare to workfare program under this administration are being given jobs at the White House? I don't know. I'll Taking find out for you. Taking people directly off of the welfare rolls and placing them in the White House itself physically uh, as uh, employees. Okay. I don't know, Mr. Barr, but I'll find out and get back to you, sir. I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate that because it's our information, and that raises very serious security concerns, at least in the minds of this, uh, of this member of Congress. With regard now, Mr. Free, to your background, which goes far the beyond... The gentleman yield for a no, moment. No, sir. Uh, which goes Thank far, you very much. far beyond your background and your current position. Uh, you bring to uh, your, your role as uh, director of the FBI the vast experience that we've indicated. Obviously, and aside from the so-called memo, just putting the memorandum aside that, is the, that uh, is the issue that brings us here, uh, looking at all of the evidence in your background in federal law enforcement, in federal judicial matters, in prosecutorial matters, are there facts there that, as you understand them, indicate that covered persons may have violated federal laws? Under the facts and the law, as I understand them to be, uh, the matter in my opinion, should be referred to an independent counsel. Based on the language of the independent counsel? Certainly, statute, based on the statute. Which is that, at least in pertinent part, that if there is specific, credible evidence that a covered person may have violated federal law, it should be referred to an independent counsel? I recommend that it should be, re should be referred. Based on that analysis, that, that, that there is specific and credible evidence that federal laws may have been violated. As I said yesterday, I made my recommendation on, on more than one uh, basis under the statute. There are only two bases, is that correct? That's Conflict correct. Conflict of interest and specific and credible evidence of a federal crime. You're correct. Okay, and therefore those two are the bases on which you submitted your recommendation. Um, are there any others? There are no others. Thank you. You have been very patient. I'm sure you had South. Uh, under the rules, we've, we've finished uh, the whole round. If I, I, I will, uh, if Mr. Kucinich wants to make some brief comments, I will allow that. Uh, I, I, I see. The problem is we have two people that want to make brief comments, and uh, uh, we have severe time constraints for the director. Uh, for, uh, what I wanted to do was just yield. Uh, it was to uh, yield a, uh, a minute to uh, my friend, Congressman. All right, I will uh, make an exception. Uh, and I will allow you one minute and uh, my colleague from California one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my one minute to Congressman Lantos. I want to thank my friend for yielding. I cannot express outrage strong enough at Mr. Barr's observation that individuals on welfare somehow represent a unique security risk in this country. One of our colleagues, Congresswoman Woolsey, was on welfare for a protracted period of time. She's a highly respected, valuable member of the Congress of the United States. I have no idea whether any individual who had been on welfare is currently working in the White House, but welfare recipients are American citizens. To be presumed no more loyal and no less loyal than Mr. Barr. And his question to the director looking into this issue I think is preposterous beyond words. I thank my friend for yielding. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Horn. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Uh, what I want to do is defend you from some of these assaults. Well, then I'm glad and, I yielded and, the extra. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can give me a few more seconds. Uh, the other side is talking in, in great shock and concern that we might think about a contempt of Congress situation. Well, let, this goes back to 1792 and George Washington and the St. Clair expedition. The president decided then, give Congress all the papers on the St. Clair expedition, and he did. That was the first president and the first president. 
And what gets me is, of course we have a right to file a contempt of Congress if they don't comply with the subpoena. Now, the chairman has indicated they'd try to work something out, they'd redact certain things, the chairman might want to look at it or some designated members of the committee. But we have a clear right to compel the papers from the executive branch and particularly the Department of Justice. The grain v. Doherty is very clear. Every student in political science studies that case, 1927. Uh, the question was, could Congress get the documents out of the Department of Justice, a rather corrupt department at that time, I might say, and I don't say the current one is corrupt, but we have a right to see the papers. We've been stiffed by the White House, as I said yesterday, for five solid years of not providing the Congress with the evidence we need in a lot of these cases. And all I want to say, Mr. Chairman, is there's a long precedent and we should not get upset when somebody says, well, if you don't give us the documents, a contempt citation will be voted. And I assure you it will be voted by the majority. I yield the rest of my time, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Micah, who has a point of personal privilege. The gentleman will state his point of <clears throat> personal privilege. Just a quick uh, closing comment that, in fact, the uh, director is hired by the uh, president in this administration and the attorney general. <clears throat> And if ever there's a case uh, for us uh, pursuing a contempt of Congress, uh, this would be the case. We represent the people, well, and that's our obligation. So, Mr. Director, if you don't get fired and we don't get smeared, we'll both be doing good. Thank you. Mr. Burton, may, may I put one thing on the record? You sure With can. your permission, and I've got this note from my uh, general counsel after you asked a question with respect to Mr. Wickman. Mr. Mr. Wickman. Uh, I'm told by my counsel that uh, Mr. Wickman was concerned with the question of uh, DOJ attorneys accessing what we call asset files. An asset file is not the substantive information, but lists the name and address of the informant, which is the most sensitive files that we have. Uh, I'm told that um, uh, once the DOJ attorneys understood that the asset files were not substantive, uh, that was the end of that issue. But let me report, let me get some more information and report back well, to you. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, real quickly have you add to the information that I'd like to have, and that is, did his successor give any information like that that he did not want to give to DOJ, to DOJ, uh, after Mr. Wickman left? Okay. I will check that. I would, I would be shocked if that was the case. But oh. let me find out, and I've been shocked before. Let me report back to you. Okay. Let me just say that you have been very candid. You've taken a lot of flack from some people on the committee. I just want you to know that uh, my admiration for you uh, has been enhanced by your performance here before the committee. I, I gave you a couple of pointed questions that I probably shouldn't have, and for those things I apologize. But uh, I look forward to working with you, and I think the committee does in the future. And I hope we can work this thing out on the memo. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lantos, a pleasure to appear before here, and uh, we'll work with you as closely as we can. The committee stands in recess till 1230.